Let's begin. We have a great session here of uh, three papers on, on climate issues. And um, I would usually say something about how they're great papers without really knowing that. But in fact, I've heard all these papers, so I'm eager to hear them again and really think hard about their messages. So we have, we'll start with Gary Lynn, and then we'll go to Ishan Nath, and then Farid uh, uh, Farouk. So uh, Gary, go ahead and get started. And we do have a pretty tight schedule. You only have 20 minutes, and then we'll have uh, 10 minutes for discussion after uh, each paper. So I don't want to crowd you out. So Gary, why don't you just get, uh, I would just get started now and take this extra couple minutes uh, uh, to have a little more time. All right. Thanks, Sam. And, and Sam, thanks to the organizers, um, Anton and Costas, for, and others who have organized this. Um, so this is a, you know, this is a paper that's we're going to try to understand the economic effects of of climate change, particularly in, you know, with dynamics and with space as, as well. Um, and so this is joint work with Ivan Rudik. Oh, this is wrong. So, so <laughs> I have this mixed up. So, so he's at Cornell um, and I am at Iowa State, right? And then um, it's also a joint with um, William Tan, who is a graduate student at, at Cornell and Ariel Ortiz Bobia, who is also at Cornell. Uh, and so the, the question we're at is, what's the effect of weather and climate in a spatially connected economy? And what we're going to be thinking about is climate-induced warming, right? And so the idea we have is that, you know, the increased prevalence of extreme heat is already ex affecting exposed industries and local amenities. Um, and the impacts are heterogeneous across sector and space, okay? Um, there's evidence that this is propagating through the supply chain. So we want to be thinking about all of this stuff. And in particular, what we want to be thinking about is this, this idea of market-based adaptation, which is, which is kind of like a, a market response to, uh, to climate change, right? So that would be different from like, you know, innovation adaptation, which we're not going to be talking about at all, right? Where you, you, know, you, you invent ACs to adapt to extreme heat. Here we're thinking about the fact that um, people have the ability to move from a particular, particular location, right? Um, you know, they can reallocate to different jobs, you know, switch industries or sectors that are more exposed. Um, and then we want to be thinking about trade itself as a response uh, to mitigate these effects, right? So this is what we're going to be um, largely focusing on, okay? Um, and so what we did was to develop a dynamic spatial climate economy model. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to leverage the model structure to do um, you know, two key things, right? And then a third to kind of, um, and the first is that we're going to, we're going to, we're going to leverage the, the macro structure to kind of speak to a microeconomic literature that tries to estimate um, the effect of weather on productivity and the effect of weather on local amenities. What's going to be different is that uh, the model is going to tell us um, how, how, you know, spatial linkages matter for this estimation process and how dynamics matter for this process as well. Okay. Um, and so this, all this is going to be coming from kind of manipulating the equilibrium conditions of the model to derive the estimating equations. Uh, the second is that since we have the macro structure, then we can actually do simulations, right? So then we're going to simulate the effect of climate change and really warming, right? So it's going to be temperature and welfare. Uh, and so we're going to you know, feel a little bit more comfortable because we have internally consistent um, weather impact parameter estimates, and then we're going to uh, you know, couple that with our simulation. And then we're going to decompose the value of adaptation in the sense that, um, you know, the adaptation we're thinking about is labor reallocating, whether across industries or location, and, you know, you know, trade as a response to kind of mitigate the effects of a climate shock. And we're going to be shutting off each mechanism to see which one matters most. Okay. Um, while we're at it, we, we have, you know, bells and whistles in the model. So we're going to have um, you know, try to represent climate variability, um, the distribution of climate, you know, for example, the, to move away from like kind of the mean, the average that people usually use in, in, in the macro literature on climate change, right? And we're going to be kind of seeing how that matters, how does intermediate goods matter, you know, different stuff like that. So we're going to be, you know, seeing which effects seem to be first order, okay? Okay. 
Um, and then the final thing we're going to do is, is kind of, a, you know, create, you know, like a reduced form approach that is light on the assumptions that, you know, of course, the macro models, yeah, and the structural model, you have to take a stand on, um, you know, functional forms. And, and so we're going to, we're going to do a reduced form thing that, that relies on, on some envelope theorem. And that's going to be a way of kind of validating our model. And we're going to say that it, you know, it matches kind of like the, the features that we see uh, from the structural model. Okay. Um, but I'm going to spend more time on one and two. Okay. And so the model basically builds on the work by Kali and the Dorfkin and Power in their Econometric 2019, right? Which is basically marrying um, a standard multi industry EK model with input output loops um, with a dynamic labor adjustment, right? Dynamic discrete choice household problem, as in Artuk, Chaudhary, and McLaren AER paper 2010. And so if you, if you focus on a particular market, and for us, a market is a location and industry, right? Or location and sector. So you can see that, you know, firms are gonna produce using some local structures. We're gonna think of it as fixed capital. They have some productivity. They use intermediate goods. They produce some output. They're maximizing profit. Their problem is static, okay? Um, and then they could sell it to the consumers, right? Uh, and the consumer is going to eat that at any point in time, their flow utility, but they're also going to eat some local amenities that are you know, different from the consumption. And uh, the, the, the consumers are forward looking, so they're going to you know, maximize it, their present value of utility. Right? And so the key thing that's going to come in for us is that we're going to have this distribution of temperature, local daily temperature, and we're going we're gonna to feed this, allow this to affect productivity. right? and allow it to affect local amenities. And so this, these are the things that we're going to target, right? Estimate. And since this is one particular market, we're going to allow it to interact with other markets, right? So this is, this, these red dashed lines are going to show you the linkages between other markets in the sense that this market is going to, you know, use intermediate imports from, from other markets, okay? Um, labor is going to be able to switch out from one market to the next, right? and so forth, right? And you could import and, you know, consumers can import from other markets as well to eat, okay? Um, and so a quick overview of the model is just, just think of it, right? So a static in court model, say you have like, you know, discrete number of uh, locations, discrete number of industries, arbitrarily, time is discrete. We're gonna have two tier preferences, right? So upper Cobb Douglas over the sectorial aggregate and lower CES, um, over varieties within any industry, which you're going to have as a continuum of goods, right? So we're going to have a continuum of varieties. Um, goods and factor markets are competitive, but we're going to have like goods mobility, bilateral frictions, and we're going to have labor mobility frictions, right? Okay. And so on the production side, we're going to think that a producer of this variety that we just said, you know, within some industry, um, it's going to use this, this kind of Cobb Douglas production function, right? So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be, um, you know, using local structures here, right? At some rental rate, it's going to be using labor, okay? At some wage rate, it's going to be using, you know, intermediate inputs uh, from other, other sectors and location. And then the important thing for us is going to be this Eaton Quarton type thing, right? Where, where the, the sector itself, each variety is a draw from some fresh air distribution, um, with a scale parameter of Z, right? Um, which is location, sector specific, and also time specific. And then with some shape parameter theta, which is usually typically the trade elasticity for us, right? And so this is where we're gonna be feeding in um, kind of like the climate effects because it's gonna be a measure of um, average productivity or fundamental productivity that's gonna capture all these local climate effects, okay? And in particular, we're going to assume that there's this, you know, for that productivity, there's going to be this, um, you know, this, this, this portion, which is non-temperature, right? That's going to interact in this multiplicative separately, separately way, right? Uh, with temperature, right? And so we're going to be thinking of temperature as a vector of one degree bins, counting the number of days in the year T in that bin. And we're going to estimate this, this, this parameter. We're going to estimate it um, sector specific parameters. Um, but at first, I'm going to show you like kind of like an aggregate response um, across all sectors to, to fix ideas about how we're thinking about the distribution. Okay. 
All right, so this, this, this G function is going to give us the sector productivity effect of an additional day at some temperature and T. Okay. On the consumption side, it's going to be, you know, the typical dynamic discrete choice model where you're going to say at any point in time, the households are going to find themselves in some market. They're going to inelastically supply labor. They're going to receive some competitive wage rate. Um, there's no savings, right? So there's um, no savings from the uh, households. And then they're going to consume their real wage, right? So, and, and, and if they're non employed, we're going to allow them to have some outside option, right? Then they're going to get some constant payoff. Okay. Um, and then the key thing for us is that is this amenities, right? So you're going you're, you're gonna to eat this consumption um, and then you're going to eat this uh, local amenities. And this local amenities, again, is going to have some kind of non temperature part. And then we're going to have feeding the impact here, right? And so the key thing, again, is that we're going to be estimating this parameter, which is going to be um, common across locations because we, we feel that's what we can credibly do. Okay, and then at the end of the year, then they, you know, they look forward, they get some shock, and they, they think about their migration shocks, and then they right maximize in the future. Okay, all right, and so the the key conditions that we're gonna we're gonna leverage to estimate effect of temperature and productivity is gonna be um, like some trade flows kind of um, uh, you know specification, and so basically in equilibrium, the bilateral expenditures, right, trade expenditures are of you know n and i location n and i relative to its own expenditures right so this is you know fixing some industry k is gonna is gonna depend on the differences in impacts of temperature between n and i okay um, and so this is gonna be where we, we have our our data right it's gonna be, depend on differences in other unobservable component components of productivity between n and i this is we're going to be trying to control for that with fixed effects, right? And it's going to depend on the bilateral trade cost between N and I, okay? And, and finally, on the input cost, cost differences, um, right, across location. And so, we, we, you know, in the, in the appendix, we show that using this bilateral expenditures instead of the standard kind of GDP regressions, let us kind of, you know, partial out multilateral trade effects that way we argue creates biases for the, the ones that ignore these spatial linkages, right? So the specification that does, okay? And then on the amenities side, um, what we're gonna get is basically the household's oil equation, right? So it's kind of like, right, in equilibrium, we're gonna get the, you know, the share of households in N migrating to I relative to the share of staying in N is gonna be, um, you know, differences in the amenity impacts of temperature. Again, this is where we're feeding in our temperature again, this part is unobservable, right? Um, components of amenities between N and I, we're gonna be trying to control for those with fixed effects. And we're gonna have time invariant um, bilateral moving costs. We're gonna have differences in wheel ranges between N and I, and then we're gonna have differences in continuation values between N and I, right? And so the key is that this would be the, you know, kind of like your present value, this is like your future. Um, continuation value, right? And then it's these flows are sufficient statistics for, for that. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, this is data, this is data, right, data, and then we have to control for these things so we can see this. Okay. All right, so I'll show you um, kind of what we get, right? So if you look at the left, um, the left picture, right? So this would be the um, kind of response function uh, on you know, temperature and productivity. Right, and so this is level productivity, Sam. So level, right? So this is level, um, and so so here we're gonna be thinking that, right? So um, the way you want it, so the, the x-axis is gonna be measuring, um, is gonna be measuring the you know days at a particular temperature, right? And then this is gonna be the marginal effect. So for example, if you think of you know you look at this distribution for say Norway, right? This would tell you that here are the bins, how many days was Norway, for example, here at 10 degrees, right? Okay. And so the way you would get it is that if you have a particular distribution in this, you know, for this year for Norway, then you're gonna you're gonna feed it onto this thing out of all the productivity effects, right? And then you get another year, you're gonna feed this distribution on it again, get the different you know, productivity effects, and you're gonna difference them out. So that's how you're gonna get the difference in productivity effect. 
Um, the key thing here is that this, this response function is telling us that extreme heat, um, right? So more curvature matters a lot more for, um, you know, uh, productivity than extreme cold, right? Okay. And then similarly here, this would be the response function for local amenities. And here it would tell us that, well, you know, on both sides, it's in you know, a strong curvature. So, so both extreme cold and heat matter uh, for that as well, okay? Uh, but this is just kind of like aggregating across all sectors. And so we did try to separate it out, um, you know, according to different sectors. So for example, if you look at agriculture, you see this sharp curvature would then tell you that it's more sensitive to, to, to heat, right? Um, than say manufacturing, right? And then services would be would be less so. Okay, so we think that's uh, not too crazy, right? Okay. And so once we have these response functions, right, in particular, you're going to think of these sector specific responses, and then we're going to have um, these local amenities, then um, what we're going to do is we're going to arm with those uh, parameter estimates, we're going to do our simulation, right? And so what are we going to do? We're going to be shocking the model um, from 2015 to you know, the end of the century with daily temperature on the average RCP 4.5 warming trajectories, right? And so we're going to be doing it from 17 different climate models, and we're going to kind of take the average um, of that, right? So this is kind of like a, a you know a, a, a mild scenario, if you will, right? So, okay, uh, and then we're going to compare that against a simulation where daily temperature is fixed at the initial levels, okay? And so if if we if we did you know, if we, if we did the, the welfare effects, right? So I, I should say that what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna have a lot of spatial detail on the US. We're gonna allow people to move across locations and industries, right? Uh, but we're gonna connect it to the rest of the world, but with less spatial detail, right? So our focus is gonna be the US. And so if we, if we did it um, without any of the features number, like for example, we're thinking about the mean effect, um, right? So like what, uh, the macro work we do, we're thinking about no input output linkages, no adaptation, right? All of that stuff was shut out with every feature and we're gonna talk about it. This is what we'd get, right? So this would be closest to the standard kind of dice model, right? Um, that people would use. And so then you say, okay, you expect this, right? So you get, um, you know, negative impacts on the South, right? Because, right, they're getting kind of more, they're swapping out uh, more moderate days for more extremely hot days, right? And then in some sense, you're going to get better distribution in like, um, you know, the Great Lakes and the Northeast, right? So you'd expect that, right? For the colder places, they're kind of swapping out. So we'd say that, you know, a population weighted average welfare effect would actually be positive for the US, right? 1.9%. Um, and then we, if we look at like, you know, the rest of the world, right? We could see that, well, you know, um, most of the European countries, which are, you know, tend to be colder are going to be, um, um, impacted positively by climate change in the sense that you're going to get better weather, but then you have like China and, um, you know, Brazil and India and, and the thickness of these bars tell you the population, right? So even though you have this kind of, you know, more countries kind of gaining, but then a lot of population is concentrated in the ones that are going to be negatively affected. And so the overall impact is negative. Okay. All right. So a quick run on model structure, right? And then we get to adaptation. So, so here, um, what we're gonna be, if you think of, you focus on this first row, which is the basic structure that I just said, none of the, the, the bells and whistles, no market adaptation first, then we'll get this 1.9% for the US. If we allow, we allow for market adaptation, then you see that this, this goes up, right? Okay, so that, you know, it, it makes sense, right? That people are gonna mitigate um these effects in response right and so here what we're going to be doing as we go down is to you know this is with you know this first column is is going to be or the second column is going to be with uh market adapt without market adaptation it's going to be with market adaptation um and so then we're going to say if we add input output loops then um then this thing you know lowers your wealth welfare right so input output loops will kind of exacerbate negative global climate shocks, right? Which is, it's, it's consistent with what we expect. Uh, amenities seem to matter uh, more than productivity, right? So if, it's, if we're adding amenities, the effect on amenities, then um, we see that this goes down uh, significantly, right? 
and then you know this one is it's it's kind of not crazy right because in the sense that uh if there's no market-based adaptation right uh and that's the key for for exploiting this forward-looking behavior then we don't get any right we don't get any effect from this but if we allow for adaptation then we get some response right okay if we add industrial heterogeneity that lowers welfare and if we add daily temperature that lowers welfare as well, right? So, so if we think about the distribution and the part from the mean, and that matters a lot, right? And then overall, these things uh, matter, okay? Um, and so if we think about now the full model, right? So now we have our amenities, we have our um, you know, distribution of climate, um, of, of temperature, right? And we have market-based adaptation, then we can kind of look at how the change in the population share, right? So then again, this is what we'd expect. Then um, there would be kind of like migration from the South, so say Texas, Florida, right? And it's gonna go up to the Great Lakes and the Northeast, right? Some to the Midwest, right? And then like California, Arizona are gonna get you know worse weather and then people are gonna be moving out, right? Um, and then we could talk, I won't spend the time, but we can talk about how it affects the industrial composition as well, right? And so four minutes key... remaining, Gary. Oh, one minute. Okay. Four minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes. Okay. Yep. Good. Good. Right. Thanks. And so we're going to think about what's the value of adaptation now, right? Which was what we wanted to get at, right? Um, and so we want to think about how it responds to US welfare, right? So so just think about it, right? So the welfare of the, the full structural model with no adaptation, right? We just want to act, uh, isolate the effect of this is negative 4%, right? And so what we find is that if we if we add trade adjustment alone, right, then that would improve welfare by um, 0.67 percentage points. Um, but if we allow just industry switching and migration alone, then that has little aggregate effect, right? And so basically, this is this would be saying that um, at least within the simulation, that trade seems to matter a lot more, right? So um, to this adaptation mechanism. And if we if we add them all in, then we see that there is this kind of complementary effect. Right. Okay. Um, right. So, so in some sense that the labor switching allows you to exploit um, further benefits. Right. Um, and so this kind of like pictures to say that you know trade is kind of has a um, kind of regressive approach, right? In the sense that it benefits the north and the colder regions, right, uh, uh, better than the uh, the south. Okay. Um, and then you know labor re reallocation would expect to have this effect, right? That that is going to benefit because if you're in a hot location you want to move out but then you're going to create these pecuniary externalities and others by kind of crowding them out and driving them near the ages right um and so the south uh, value adaptation the most right when we, when we kind of put it all together right um and so yeah and then i'll i'll wrap up right so 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 here what we we build what did was to build a dynamic spatial model to understand the cost of climate change, um, the role of adaptation, right? This market-based adaptation, and and how to represent the climate economy, which 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 um, features matter, which features features are first order. Um, we introduce a new dynamic reduced form approach um, to impact estimation, which I think is uh, kind of cool uh, to kind of validate the structural model. Uh, we find that there are large negative global impacts from level effects on productivity and amenities, um, dynamics and space, um, aggregation, all matter, right? And migration and industry reallocation are complementary with trade. Um, and, and we say that we have also done this with a you know, productivity growth effect in earlier drafts. So we, we have done both that. So thanks. Yeah, so I'm done. Tom? Uh, Gary, Tom Hurdle here. I, I really like the presentation. I haven't read the paper yet, but I'm really impressed. Um, I'm a little um, little confused about how the trade and the location come together. I mean, it looks, I assume the trade is largely is international trade and the location is intranational within the US. Um, are you also attempting to incorporate state interstate trade? I was I was a little confused about how those two things come together right. in the uh, data and estimation. Um, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so Tom, yeah, so, so sorry about that because of the shortness of the presentation. I understand. I understand yeah. entirely. They think about what to cover. You're exactly right. So basically, um, what we do is we, we have um, 
interstate trade in the US, right? So then people can move across states, okay? They can migrate and they can migrate across um, uh, you know, locations and, and states can trade with each other. But states can also trade with the rest of the world. So, so, so when we think about the US, we think about you know, 50 states, right? Spatial detail. But then when we think about the rest of the world, we don't have that spatial detail. You're just sectors and, and a country. And you have a full bilateral trade matrix within the US, uh, state to state. Yes, uh, right, right. That is, where does that come from? Right, so, so that we get from, um, we use the same thing from Kali and the Dark in Ampara, right? So we use this, um, uh, uh, no, I, that escapes me, right? So. Okay, that's okay. Yes, I, I don't, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so we use so, a, a kind of similar procedure to them. Okay, okay. Right, so, so, so that we're kind of borrowing and even the, you know, the migration kind of data across states is this community okay. survey. Yeah, that I'm familiar with. Yeah, quick follow up, if I may, Sam. Um, yeah. On a, a, it's kind of a separate issue. I was really interested to see uh, perhaps the reverse migration from south to north within the U.S. Of course, what we've seen over the last couple of decades, even as it has, as there has been warming, um, we've moved seen the move to the south. Um, so it looks like you're undoing that. Um, any thoughts on that? Any idea about how well you're a framework would backcast, for example, in a migration right, sense? Right. I think I think the way I think about it, Tom, so that's a great point, actually. Um, so, so the way I think about it is that we're not, we're just kind of capturing one element, right? So we're thinking about warming, um, nothing else, right? And then we're also uh, not thinking about, um, you know, the, the usual adaptation, right? Like innovation and, and stuff like that, right? So we're kind of ignoring that part because we haven't figured out how to, how to include it, right? So, so I would say maybe you know that part would kind of mitigate some of that uh, movement if people are able to kind of innovate um, and adapt, right? But so this would be purely like if you didn't, if we didn't allow you to kind of innovate, right? We just want to think about the value of this this market based adaptation. So we have to abstract from that. You referred to air conditioning earlier on. I'm sure that place played a role. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. A, a huge role, right? <laughs> But Gary, okay, how soon would you ex how soon would the model think that the reverse migration would begin? Because maybe you're not this is more like a projection of what's gonna happen in the next 30 years. Am I kind of right in thinking that way? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. But but no, you're exactly right, Sam. So, so that's the way I think about it anyway. But then I, I'm not sure because I think we'd have to some way try to think about the innovation to kind of answer that question. But, but I'm just saying straight up the, the model, um, what, how should I think about in the things you showed us when those would be happening, I guess? What, what's oh, the... so, so, so this would be like the end of the century, like 2100. Right. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, and I, I wanted to say that I liked the, well, I, obviously I liked that, the level effect results and, and the distinction between the the amenity effect and the productivity effect and the the inverse U for the amenities, but just sort of a hockey stick shape for the productivity, yeah. I thought was pretty compelling. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to oh, say thanks. that. that thanks, thanks Tom. I appreciate that. And, and Tom, too, thanks for the um, right. So it, it pushed us with a with a level effect, right? So I think Tom... I'd mentioned that in, in one previous talk. So, we, you know, we, we took that seriously. Thank you. Yeah, good. Ishan? Uh, cool, thanks. This is super interesting as always to see Gary. I guess I was curious for another thing you didn't have time for in the talk, which is to hear a little bit more about how the costs of migrating were calibrated or like where that came from in the data. And I was, so I was curious first, uh, is the migration across space also allowed internationally or only within the U.S.? Uh, and then I guess the second question is, you didn't have time, obviously, for the full dynamic discrete choice estimation. So I was wondering if you could give us a little flavor of basically how costly you guys are backing out it is for people to decide to move and sort of what identifies that cost in the data. Right. So, so, in, so in, the data, in, the, in the specification, we're going to we're gonna kind of pull that out as a fixed effect, right? Kind of, it's similar to what like ACR does. Um, and the way we're gonna um, kind of estimate the dynamic feature model is, is 
we're going to have the, the logic form. So we're going to have uh, this conditional choice probability approach, right? So that's kind of what we're leveraging. We're, it's not estimation to simulation, but you know, we actually have a closed form solution um, and we can pin that down. Um, what was the other point again, Isha? I guess the other point was like, how costly are you finding it for people to be, for people to move across space, both within the US? Ah, and okay. So, so, so yeah, yeah. So, so I don't know at the top of my head, Ishan, we, we had at some point in time, but we had kind of thought about, but, but we can definitely look at that and, and, and see. For sure. I just think it would be really interesting because it's like remarkably hard to find estimates of just kind of what is the cost, like, how much are people willing to pay to not have to move from Texas to Minnesota? Right, which is like right, a critical right. underlying. No, 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 that's a great point. Actually, yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Um, yeah, yeah, we, we can, we, we'll look at that. Yeah, because I remember actually Arthur Shardu and McLaren, that was a big point for them to kind of say, what what are the actual costs? And um, they had follow-up papers on that. So we, we can definitely look into that then. Um, it would be cool yeah, to benchmark yeah. against the literature too. Like I think in one of Melanie Morton's papers, she estimates this in Indonesia. And then there's like another paper uh, in the US where it might be estimated. So it's just, okay. I feel like that's a thin literature and you guys have something to say about it. So I'd be interested. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Ishan. Yeah, yeah, we definitely take that into account. Oh, I remember your, la your, your last point. No. So you were saying, so what we have is, um, so within the US, people can move across states. You can trade with states. Um, you can reallocate across industries. Um, but there's no international migration so because right. we just don't have the data. So, so the way we want to think about our work is that we, we, we're less concerned with um, global coverage, right? So, so, you know, if you think about like the, the, the typical climate economy model, it's more about global coverage. We are more concerned about um, like taking the model to the data kind of a thing, right? So we want to link this macro and micro. Um, and so the spatial kind of you know, data that's available that's going to limit us, right? So we're, we actually tried to apply for some European data so if we could get some space there, um, but that hasn't worked out yet, you know, so hopefully. Cool, cool. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Isha. Um, feel free to, to raise your hand. We have a few more minutes, but I, I'll ask a question in the meantime, which is to what extent, so suppose you had the kind of data you're using in the US for India, that might be very interesting because you're using this cross-sectional within country variation to identify these effects, but then you're seeing very few data points in the extreme that where there really is a cost. I mean, you could kind of see that in the amenity one where the standard error goes way up at the very end because you probably have very few data points there, but in India, you'd actually have a lot of data points at the high end extreme. So it'd be kind of interesting to use this methodology for different countries where you could, to the extent you could get that kind of data. But anyway. Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely, Sam. Absolutely. So, Sam, if you know what data there, let us know, please. So, um, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely, Sam. Great point. Yeah, Erwin, please. Uh, Thanks. Um, um, there's, there's, before I ask my question, there's one question in the chat from Julio Fournier. Um, he says, thanks for the presentation. Maybe I missed this, but how do you estimate weather effects, how your estimated weather effects grow in your long-term projections until 2010? I assume that's until 2100. Oh, how, how does it grow? Oh, sorry, let me see if I can check it. Gary, you're just taking it from the climate models, right? Oh, you mean the estimate of productivity effects? No. So we're actually estimating it ourselves. All right. So this is. Um, uh, all right. So this is this is the specification that we're using. Right. So we're using like trade data. Right, so the equilibrium conditions tells us that there's a relationship between trade data and productivity, trade costs and input costs, right? And so we actually, I mean, at a very early version of the paper, we kind of you know, spent a lot of time thinking about this estimation where um, the, the equilibrium conditions could also give us kind of like a, a GDP uh, relationship between temperature, which looks consistent with what 
other people have um, done in the literature, but then it would it would have like multilateral trade effects that would um, create some problems that we said you, you'd have to get around, right? And so the nice thing is that this trade specification allows us to get around the bias from multilateral trade effects, you know, because of some assumptions. But yeah, we do estimate it actually. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll just be very quick since we'll be transitioning in two minutes. So in, in your wrap up, you, says, you said um, that migration and industry reallocation are complementary with trade. So I'm just wondering, um, do you get to distinguish um, the particular type of industry um, whenever you refer to reallocation? So for example, if you have a heavy manufacturing industry, for example, that that can still be located in a place where um, it um, gets hot, but since they're inside um, a, a building with air conditioning, for example, then they could still um, stay in a place where um, it's getting hot, um, or probably it's it's just um, directly related to to, peop to to migration, right? Um, because people are moving, then it's forcing um, industries to move where. Um, people are moving as well. So I'm I'm just um, wondering about that, but yeah. Uh, let me see, right, so, 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 uh, so, so our, 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 our kind of strategy is not as fine, right? So, so I guess usually the um, environmental empirical literature would, would look at like kind of finer details of an, of an industry, right? So you're thinking about ag and you're thinking about a particular industry. Here we're gonna be kind of aggregating to 20 industries. So it's a little bit cruder and it's kind of like a trade off to, to get to it, but we're going to be capturing, I think, some of some of what you're saying, but not in a um, uh, a kind of you know as, as rich a way if you were to look closer on it, right? So it's like you look at the micro picture, but you give up on the link into the macro, right? So we're trying to kind of um, you know meet that some way in the middle. I don't know if that helps, sir. Yeah, that helps. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, sir. good. So our next paper is by Ishan Nath. Um, Climate change, uh, the food problem, and the challenge of adaption through sectoral reallocation. So, Ishan, are you able to get on? Uh, I need Gary to stop sharing. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, why am I not? Oh, oh, here, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. No worries. There we go. Ah. All right, can people see my slides? Uh, okay. All right. Wait, sorry, people can't see my slides, right? Whoops, we can see them. They don't look quite full screen, but. Oh. Uh, uh, Okay, is that better? Okay. Yeah, well, that, I think that's fine. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, this is my paper, uh, Climate Change, the Food Problem and the Challenge of Adaptation Through Sexual Reallocation. Okay, so to motivate the paper, I'll start with this graph that shows kind of a summary of this large literature that exists of the impacts, estimating the impacts of global warming on agricultural productivity throughout the world. And there's basically two key things I want you to take away from this picture that motivate this paper. The first is that climate change damages in agriculture are expected to be large and concentrated in places where a lot of people currently work on farms. So just to take an example here in East Africa, we have Ethiopia where the agriculture share GDP is about 45%. And this projection suggests a 30% decline in agricultural productivity in this kind of high emissions baseline uh, climate change scenario. So right away, if you assume no re reallocation across sectors, that would be a 15% drop in people's, in people's incomes from these large agricultural productivity shocks in these places where a lot of people work on farms. But the second thing I want you to take away from this picture is that there's a lot of heterogeneity. We know that in general, extreme temperatures are, are bad for crops and moderate temperatures are good. So we can expect global warming to have neutral to even, even some positive effects on agriculture in colder places at higher latitudes. So this underscores how critical it is to know where the world's farms will be in the future. When you look at this map, it's, it's clear that global warming will be really, really bad uh, in poor countries if they continue to specialize heavily in agriculture, 
but it might be a lot less bad if we were able to move a lot more farms to Canada and ship a lot more food to India. So that's basically my research question. How do we expect global warming to reallocate production between agricultural and non-agricultural sectors throughout the world? And what are the welfare consequences of the reallocation we might expect to see? So there are basically two conditions required for this kind of grow more food in Canada hypothesis to really help us adapt to global warming. The first is that for hotter countries to actually gain by reallocating away from farming, it also needs to be the case that other sectors of the economy are less vulnerable to the effects of extreme heat, such that it's comparative advantage in agriculture, not just absolute advantage that's moving away from the equator. We have some evidence from other work, including some new evidence that Gary just showed that there's also impacts uh, of extreme temperatures in non-agricultural sectors. So what we really need is systematic evidence from around the world about how large those non-agricultural productivity effects are in order to evaluate whether at least in principle, hotter places could gain if they were able to reallocate away from farming. So I answer this part of the question empirically by using data from around the world to estimate the effects of extreme temperatures on non-agricultural productivity. And here I find indeed that while there are some meaningful effects of temperature in these sectors, they are likely to be much smaller than the effects in agriculture, suggesting that indeed, at least in principle, if hotter places were able to reallocate away from farming, that might really help those countries adapt to warming. But there's a second condition required for this sort of adaptation to really help. And that's that specialization in agriculture needs to actually respond to comparative advantage. In reality, as I'll show on the next slide, the simplest Ricardian story does not do a good job of explaining specialization in agriculture throughout the world. So to project a, a general equilibrium response to global warming that's consistent with the patterns of specialization we, we observe in the world today, I'm going to calibrate this global model of sectoral specialization and trade I then embed the empirical estimates of the impacts of global warming on sector by country productivity into the model and use the model to simulate the effects of climate change on sectoral reallocation, trade, and welfare throughout the world. And just to clarify, when I say climate change here, I'm talking about extreme temperatures and precipitation, not things like storms and sea level rise, which are outside the scope. Okay, so let me elaborate a little on what I meant about the simplest Ricardian story not explaining patterns of specialization in the world very well. This graph on the left here shows relative labor productivity in agriculture compared to non-agriculture as a function across the countries in the world as a function of per capita income on the x-axis. What we see here is basically that the rich countries are really good at farming relative to non-farming compared with poorer countries. So to put some numbers behind these data points, the richest 90th percentile countries in the world are about four times more productive than 10th percentile poorer countries in manufacturing, but they're about 45 times more productive in agriculture. So specialization followed the simplest Ricardian story. We would already expect to see richer countries like Canada specializing most of their economy in agriculture and for poorer countries like India to have very few farmers. But of course, what we have in practice is the opposite. This pattern in which poorer countries are specializing really heavily in this very low productivity agricultural sector. So why do poor countries specialize in agriculture despite their low productivity? This is a phenomenon that the macro development literature calls the food problem. And it's an idea that I argue in this paper is central to understanding the general equilibrium effects of global warming. The main idea with the food problem is that because food is a necessity for people to survive, which formally in the model is captured by these non-homothetic preferences over food and a really low elasticity of substitution between food and non-food, what that means is that when people are poor and the relative price of food is high, the quantity of food consumed can't fall by very much. So food ends up taking up a large share of expenditures in these poorer countries with unproductive farms. That consumption has to come from somewhere. So this high expenditure share on agriculture will tend to come in equilibrium with a high production and labor share uh, also in agriculture. Now in principle, these places could instead meet their domestic subsistence needs to eat by importing more of their food. But in practice, the patterns of trade we observe in the world suggest that this trade mechanism is extremely weak in the poorest countries. 
The stylized fact about that that I calculated in this paper is that the average person in the poorest quartile of the world consumes 91% domestically produced food compared with 45% in the richest quartile. So in these relatively closed economies, the high production and labor shares in agriculture follow from the need to meet these domestic subsistence needs to eat in the presence of their really unproductive farms and what appear to be really high barriers to importing food into these places. So in light of this, my model is going to make predictions about these two competing effects that drive the, the general equilibrium response to the sort of agriculture bias decline in productivity we might expect global warming to be creating in hotter parts of the world. On the one hand, as climate change makes people poorer and makes food more expensive, that's going to tend to, because of these subsistence needs, that's going to tend to raise the expenditure share in agriculture, uh, which all else equal is going to keep more of the economy stuck in farming, kind of counterintuitively, uh, even, even as they get much worse at, at producing agriculture. And then on the other, other hand, you have what I think of as the more intuitive Ricardian effect, where when the relative productivity of farming falls in these places, they'll tend to shift towards importing more food and exporting uh, more of the, uh, uh, the non-agricultural goods, such that labor uh, leaves the agricultural sector, uh, at least to the extent that they're open to trade. So ultimately the degree to which this sort of reallocation away from agriculture in hot places is going to contribute to global warming adaptation is going to be a horse race between these two forces, the food problem and trade. When these poorer places get hit, these hotter places get hit really hard by global warming, people are still going to need to eat, either by putting more effort and more resources into continuing to produce their food at home, even as the climate uh, gets hotter and more extreme, or by shifting towards importing their food from other parts of the world that are hit less hard by global warming. And of course, uh, as you might guess from this preview, I find unfortunately that under current levels of trade openness, uh, the food problem kind of dominates this story and we get very little benefits from uh, the, this channel of climate change adaptation. And in fact, we see that global warming is likely to keep more workers stuck in the agricultural sector in these places where uh, what, what, that are hit really hard by warming. Great. So that's an overview of the paper. And now in the remaining time, I'll try to tell you as much as I can about the details. So this first part of the paper, which I'll cover briefly so I can get to the model, the goal is to estimate this relationship around the world between temperature and non-agricultural productivity to complement what we already know from this large literature about the impacts of global warming on agriculture. So to do that, the first thing I do is gather data from around the world to try to be as representative as possible. So I have this nationally representative firm level panel micro data from 17 countries that cover about 60% of the world's manufacturing output and span close to the full range of global incomes and global temperature levels. So the data goes from about the first to the 90th percentile of the world's temperature distribution and the third to the 99th percentile of the world's income distribution. So I have hot and cold countries and rich and poor countries in the sample to try to, uh, to, try to see whether the effects are heterogeneous across the world as we might expect them to be. Great, so just to cover the empirical strategy briefly, uh, I'm gonna use this data to estimate the effects of extreme temperatures on labor productivity, so output per worker, uh, in these panel regressions that control for firm and region by year fixed effects, such that we're using variation in what the same firm experiences over time, controlling for aggregate shocks to identify the impacts of global warming. And then the second thing I'm gonna do here is just let these effects of extreme temperatures vary with how, how productive the firms are, so how rich the places where the firms are operating and how hot the places where the firms are operating. So I show in the paper that from the firm for, firm's first order condition, we might expect those firms that are more productive and that those firms that are more exposed to extreme heat because they're in hotter places to have invested more in adaptation like cooling and heating to protect their workers from extreme temperatures in equilibrium. And so I try to let the data reflect that by seeing how the effects of temperature vary across space uh, in, in that way. And then what, that, uh, what these heterogeneous treatment effects are useful for also is to allow me to make predictions about temperature sensitivity across the world, including in all the countries where I don't have data. So to run the model simulations in the second part of the paper, I need to estimate the effects of global warming in Algeria without having data in Algeria. And by estimating how these effects vary with these uh, readily available features uh, of country characteristics that we also have projections for into the future, I'm able to estimate these temperature sensitivities around the world. Okay, 
So to take you briefly through the empirical results, this graph here shows you kind of an analogous version to what Gary was showing uh, of the impact of extreme temperatures on output per worker, in this case, in the manufacturing sector. And it shows importantly how these treatment effects vary across the different contexts we see in the world. So as you go up the rows here, you're looking at richer countries. As you go to the right across columns here, you're looking at hotter countries that we might expect to be more adapted to heat. So this bottom middle cell here, we can start with to get a quick, uh, to get a quick understanding of the magnitudes of these shocks. So this is a firm operating in a very poor country with approximately a moderate temperature. So we might expect this to be kind of the least adapted sort of firm. And for this kind of firm, we find that ex extreme heat over uh, 40 degrees C or about 100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, and extreme cold uh, both reduce one day at an extremely hot temperature of, of, of about 104 degrees Fahrenheit is going to reduce annual output per worker by about 0.4 percentage points, which is approximately the equivalent of one full working day. So what this is saying is that if firms are not very adapted, temperature can have huge effects on manufacturing productivity. But then that's where the impact, uh, the importance of this heterogeneity comes into play. So you can see as you move to the right within a, uh, within a row across columns that the hotter places are going to be less vulnerable. The firms in hotter places are less vulnerable to heat. As you move up across rows within a column, you can see that in the richer places, firms are less vulnerable to both extreme cold and extreme heat as they're more productive and more, uh, more invested in, in insulating their workers. Okay, five so minutes, I, is five minutes, Ishan. Oh, oh wow, I managed my time poorly. Okay, uh, so now I have these uh, impacts of global warming on manufacturing productivity that I get from combining these temperature sensitivities with changes uh, in the global climate. And that tells me, uh, and so I have these estimates uh, uh, on manufacturing productivity, which I find are meaningful uh, in some sense, but, but small relative to the effects on agriculture. So it's about a 2% decline in global manufacturing productivity compared to about a 20% decline in agricultural productivity that others have found. And so this suggests that the uh, effects on comparative advantage are similar qualitatively to the effects on, on absolute advantage and hotter countries could really gain if they were able to reallocate away from farming. Okay, and then in the second part of the paper, I use this model to, to uh, try to simulate whether these gains from reallocation are likely to occur in practice. So the model consists of a, a representative consumer worker in each country that has these non-homothetic CES preferences over the three sectoral final goods, agriculture, manufacturing, and services. Agriculture and manufacturing are traded in the model and trade in each of these sectors follows a standard Eaton and Cordum Ricardian structure. Uh, and then services are non-traded. I'm not, uh, and then I calibrate the model to, to match sectoral GDP shares and bilateral trade flows. So to take you through the critical uh, counterfactual uh, comparative static in the model, I just wanna show you this one key equation for the labor share in sector J in country K. Uh, and so this is basically like the share of workers in agriculture in a given economy. That's gonna be a function of the food you produce for domestic consumption at home, and then the gross exports to all the other countries. So this first term here, pi JKK is the domestic production share of agriculture's expenditures. Omega JK is the expenditure share in agriculture. Uh, and then the second term here is the analogous thing for all the other countries. So we can use this equation to break down this horse race between the food problem and trade. Now, the first half of the story is this change in the expenditure share. So we have a, a formula as a function of these non-homothetic preferences for the expenditure share in agriculture in a given country as a function of their relative prices and their real wage. And when we think about this kind of agricultural productivity shock, we can think about food getting more expensive and people getting poorer, so the real wage falling. And what this equation tells us is that as long as food is not very substitutable, which it's not, the increase in the relative price of food is just going to raise the expenditure share in agriculture as people still need to eat. So the sigma less than one is going to mean that the increase in relative price raises the expenditure share. And then similarly, because of these non-homothetic preferences, as climate change makes people poorer, as long as this epsilon A is small enough, which it turns out it is, that's also going to tend to raise the expenditure share in agriculture. So the first effect here in this equation is that, uh, th is that these subsistence preferences are, go are going to mean that when climate change hits these economies, they actually have a higher expenditure share, which all else equal would lead to more workers continuing to be in agriculture. 
But then we also have the Ricardian effect in this equation, where these countries would tend towards importing more of their food, so reducing their domestic production share and exporting less food to other countries. And so now we need to quantify the model to see uh, the, the, the breakdown between this horse race. So I'm going to skip the model calibration and show you some of the counterfactuals in the remaining few minutes. So this is what the model tells us for the impacts of global warming on net exports and agriculture throughout the world. So what we can see here is that there is some of this grow more food in Canada effect going on in the model simulations. There's an increase in agriculture's net exports in the hotter places and an increase in the net imports of agriculture and the net exports of, of the manufactured goods. Uh, uh, sorry, in the hotter places as the colder countries specialize a little bit more in agriculture. Uh, but we can see also that these effects are pretty small. It's like one or two percentage points in most countries uh, is the increase in agriculture's net exports. And so now uh, we can break down this, uh, break down the full comparative static between the food problem and trade by taking a few example countries and running some intermediate counterfactuals. So the blue bars here are telling us the agriculture share of GDP before global warming effects uh, are hitting these economies. So we have these hot countries, these hotter, poorer countries that are specializing more in farming. Now what the red bars tell us is if you assumed that these places uh, only, if you started off in autarky and you only take into account the impacts of the food problem on the expenditure shares. So as agriculture gets hammered in these places, they're going to tend to spend more of their incomes on food and all else equal, that would keep more production and more labor stuck in agriculture. And then the green bars show us the net effect, uh, where there's also some trade response. And in some of these places, you get some increase in imports of food that brings the, the share of GDP in agriculture and the share of labor in agriculture back down. But in most places, the trade effect is relatively small. So on average, I find about a 3% increase in agriculture share of the labor force in that poorest, hottest quartile of the world, where agricultural productivity is getting hit really hard. So now in the last minute or two, I'll just tell you about what that means for welfare. So the first thing you might think is if more of the economy is staying stuck in the sector that's getting hit really hard, that's going to be bad for kind of our standard measures of aggregate productivity or GDP. So what this graph shows you here is that accounting for this reallocation actually makes the hit to GDP much worse in these hotter countries. So the, so the green bar is, is the full equilibrium uh, in, in impact on GDP, and it's much bigger than the blue bar, which assumes that the sectoral shares kind of stay fixed at their initial levels. Uh, so you might ask yourself, why is this reallocation taking place if it seems to be exacerbating the problem? And that's because in this setting with non-homothetic preferences, the GDP or aggregate productivity effects are actually not a good measure of welfare. So what this graph shows you here is that this reallocation uh, is actually reducing the welfare effects dramatically because even, even if more labor is staying stuck in the low productivity sector, at least people then have enough food to eat. So the blue bars are telling us that the kind of fixed Counter, the fixed uh, labor share counterfactual is actually kind of a, a really unrealistic straw man. So that's basically the counterfactual in which people get poorer and food gets more expensive, but people don't change their expenditure shares. And so they're just not getting enough to eat. And so the reallocation is, is helping people be able to feed themselves, even if it's kind of making the, the measured productivity problem worse. But the other thing we can see here is that including trade into the analysis basically does nothing to the welfare effects because there's such a small trade effect in these places that are mostly closed off to trade in the present day. And so overall for the world, it's only about a 2% difference if you assume autarky or uh, include the trade effects. And that's because these places that are most vulnerable to global warming are also least open to, to trade. And so these are, this is the welfare effects you get in this kind of standard uh, no trade uh, standard standard estimated trade cost counterfactual. It's driven by this large increase in food prices in these places where agriculture gets hit. But then I also show in the paper that if you assume that poorer countries were able to trade about as much as richer countries are today, so they become more open to trade, better infrastructure, uh, lower tariffs in the future, that then the welfare effects are substantially smaller as then they're much more able to reallocate away from the hard hit sector and protect their economies from global warming. So I'm sorry I went over my time a little bit, uh, but, but that's kind of a summary of this paper. There's these potential large adaptation effects from poorer countries reallocating away from farming, but they would need to be substantially, like really massively more open to trade than they are today in order to realize these adaptation gains. Great, thanks, uh, Ichan. Uh, Tom, did you have a question? 
Yeah, uh, thanks, Ishan. Really nice presentation. I like your development of the food problem. There's one element of that that I'd like to um, throw out that maybe that that you don't have there, and that's the disequilibrium phenomenon in the labor market. Uh, there was some work done uh, quite a number of years ago by Jorgensen and some colleagues looking across a variety of sectors, but they looked across the whole 20th century and what was the optimal number of, of workers in US agriculture and what was the actual. And over time, technological change and, and, and whatnot uh, lowered the optimal um, so fast that uh, the, the, the observed uh, number of workers didn't, <laughs> didn't catch up until the end of the century. So the idea that um, there is an ongoing process of, of people leaving agriculture, but it takes time, maybe a lot of time, is, is another element of, of that food problem um, uh, that's interesting. Um, I guess the other thing, I'm sure I brought it up before, I'll just uh, repeat myself again, that we've been working a lot with um, some climate scientists on you know, heat stress on labor, and they really emphasize the humidity aspect that um, it's the interplay between heat and humidity that really matters. And I know that's difficult to capture in some of the empirical work. I just wanted to, to raise it yet again so we don't forget. Thanks, Farid. Hey, Sean, as we've talked before, great work. Thank you for the presentation. So I have a quick comment about like the case for trade. But I think like agriculture can benefit from trade not just from the output side, but also from the input side mechanisms, right? For example, if you have input output table, a lot of manufacturing like tractors and chemical applicants like pesticides and such, they go into agricultural production. So I was just wondering that despite the fact that it's just 91% of domestic expenditure share on the output side of agriculture, but if it is the case that these countries by opening up to trade in manufacturing can import uh agricultural intermediate inputs so that they can become more labor saving in fact from that mechanism so that mechanism or that channel can can help the case of trade against the food problem uh, i wanted to hear your comments on that or maybe that was just a suggestion sounds good uh i yeah i agree with all these points though, that you and tom have made i think they're very i Big fan of your paper about the endogenous feedbacks. I think that was your paper, uh, endogenous feedbacks between trade and technology and agriculture. I think that's a very important mechanism uh, that I'm not capturing here, uh, which you might think is, is just going further towards, uh, uh, I, I would think of that as expanding the, the gains from, from trade for agricultural real, uh, for climate change adaptation. So it's another mechanism in that direction. And then to Tom's point about the, the labor frictions, I would think of that as uh, I'm showing the kind of, I would think of that as uh, making the, the primary counterfactual with estimated trade costs, strengthening that result, and then weakening the results about the gains from trade. So I'm finding in the main counterfactual that there's not much movement away from uh, agriculture. And so if you think workers are stuck in agriculture because of these other frictions that prevent labor markets from reaching equilibrium, that would mean that even more workers stay stuck in agriculture. But then in the in the trade equilibrium, in the in the more lower trade costs, more trade uh, counterfactual, I'm showing a big reallocation away from agriculture. And you might want to take that with a grain of salt because I don't have these labor market frictions. Uh, and I totally agree with Tom's point about, about wet belt temperatures also. It's just kind of, uh, it's very difficult to, the historical and the future projection data is kind of very difficult. And I think that's something the climate scientists are really trying to work hard to work with economists on to get us some estimable stuff. And so hopefully in the next couple of years, there'll be some great, more great papers on that. I think there are some that are more local uh, and historical at this moment, but we don't have kind of the global systematic data we would need to fully incorporate those effects, but I totally agree they're important. Good. Uh, Fustini? Yes, thank you. A very brief one. I'm just wondering, maybe I missed this. Uh, I was wondering why we don't have the main terms in the econometric equation you showed. I think there are some interaction terms, but I think I didn't see the main terms. So is there any reason for that? Oh, uh, yeah, I just, I just didn't write it all out, but the this is like beta times some functional form of temperature. And so like in the main counterfactual, there's like a piecewise linear functional form where 
Uh, there's one effect for, for degrees times days below a certain cold threshold and one effect for degrees times days above a certain hot threshold. But you could also do it with like a, I also show it with quadratic of temperature or uh, higher degree polynomial of temperature or bins of temperature, things like that. So I just, it was just kind of shorthand. I didn't write out the full functional form, but that's the, the this term is the main effect. Yes, but what about GDP per capita? in levels as well in the equation. Don't you think that you will have a noted bias problem? Oh, I see. Uh, so GDP per capita is going to be in these uh, sector, uh, they, sorry, these region by year fixed effects. And so this is just going to be a fixed effect for like the country in that year or the state in that year. And so that'll include the, uh, the, the cross-sectional differences in GDP per capita, which yes. I totally agree we should control for. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. Good. Uh, Ichan, I think you have uh, a minute to ask a quick question, which is I, two things, actually. Malawi looked like it was actually going the wrong direction with the green bar in, in the first of those pictures, and I, I just thought it meant I didn't understand something. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah. Now, yeah, the, why did Malawi actually get higher in the green bar? Yeah. So in some of these countries, basically what turns out to matter is comparative advantage relative to your neighbors. And so in some of these places that get hit really hard by agricultural productivity effects, they still might have a slight improvement in comparative advantage relative to their closest trading partners if the countries around them got crushed even harder. So in some of the hot countries, the trade effect actually moves you a little bit more towards agricultural specialization just based on kind of the geography of your trade uh, and, and the comparative advantage relative to your trading partners. So it'd have to be that like the countries just around Malawi were hit even harder in agriculture. Right, I see. And my other question was whether you see anything, I don't know what year your data is for, but in very recent past decade, do you see gains in productivity and some of the, I mean, you just hear about all this investment in agriculture in some of the countries of Africa, then I wondered if you kind of pick that up in the aggregate data and whether that's gonna do anything. Uh, I don't I don't have, I, I forget exactly. I have to look back at a footnote to know exactly. It's like 2014 or something that the data's from, I'm, I'm not, mm -hmm. roughly speaking. I haven't actually looked at the very recent trends in agricultural productivity. Uh, but I hope they're hopeful uh, that yeah. I'm heartened by what you say, but I didn't know. Well, I, I'm not knowledgeable. It's more like scattered evidence. I don't know. Tom, do you get information about that? Sorry, I was distracted. Oh, <laughs> I don't have no, it was just the question of whether there's been a bit of a burst of productivity in agriculture in in some of the poor countries, I don't know, Somalia. Yeah, that, that, that is something we've Ethiopia. been, uh, we've been uh, following with Keith Fugley, who's kind of the guru on product, tracking productivity in agriculture globally. And uh, he makes the point that uh, this, you know, um, the technology transfer is difficult to many of these countries. The productivity of their systems, despite your, the fact that they're spending more money, isn't necessarily as high as you would think. You'd think they'd be catching up in a hurry, but that isn't necessarily the case. It's been a difficult task, I think. I guess the one other thing to add on Sam's question is like, they're so far behind that even if you had a pretty good growth rate for a few years, it's like the gap in agricultural productivity is enormous. It's like, you know, one and a half orders of magnitude. Yeah, yeah. And then um, Farid, I guess your recent paper may, speak to that a little bit too the the one that you presented in the conference for jonathan yeah i was thinking about that uh it's also a little bit about like technology transfer whether these countries are facing barriers to adopt these modern technologies to boost their productivity and what are those barriers how they interact with trade exactly yeah so you should um you should start, Farid. I think you're supposed to start it. No, we're, we're saying very accurate, 9.39. Okay. And I have 20 minutes just to be sure, right? Yes. That's right, yeah. Uh, can you see my screen well? Yeah. 
That's good. That's good. Okay, great. Thanks for having me in this nice seminar. Uh, this is joint work with Ahmad Lashkari Pool from Indiana University. The title is Can Trade Policy Mitigate Climate Change? And our starting point have been uh, noticing this common and very growing concern about the fact that uh, recent or existing climate agreements, such as the Paris Climate Accord, have failed to deliver their target outcome or any significant reduction in uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And the reason seems to be uh, because of the incentive structure in these uh, agreements on international global and uh, on, on international agreements on climate, uh, because there are strong incentives for free riding, because there are uh, many countries who have an incentive to rely on emission reductions of other countries without taking proportionate domestic abatements themselves. And there have been uh, a number of different proposals uh, in order to address this free riding in international climate agreements. Uh, we are going to address two of those that have gained uh, traction. And these two are similar in the sense that they try to combine carbon pricing uh, with trade policy. Uh, so let me just explain what these are and provide some context for the way that we are going to interpret them and evaluate them here. Uh, proposal one um, is based on a second best solution uh, in that climate conscious governments are going to include carbon border taxes in their package of trade policy in order to influence CO2 emissions outside of their boundaries. This is not just a theoretical possibility. It's been uh, a component of the EU Green Deal, for example. And my understanding is that it is a it is uh, something that is going to be explored also in the in the climate plan of the current administration in the US. Uh, proposal two takes a different perspective, and in that, climate conscious governments are going to form what we may call as a climate club and use their trade penalties collectively in order to incentivize otherwise reluctant governments to join the to join the club. So these two proposals are similar in the sense that, as I said, they try to combine carbon pricing with trade policy in order to address free riding issue. Um, however, they are different in terms of the approach because proposal one is based on um, a presumption that a global agreement on climate is unlikely to happen so that the best you could do is in fact is the second best solution to act unilaterally with these carbon border taxes. But proposal two has the presumption that because uh, carbon emissions are global bad, the way to solve the problem is also should be global and the problem with uh, existing agreements on climate um, is not their multilateral nature, but just that these agreements, um, are, they, they don't have a right or their, their architecture is flawed, so let's come up with a better uh, design of these policy agreements. Uh, so uh, with this, we are going to combine data and theory to evaluate proposal one and proposal two. The literature here is vast, my time is limited. So just let me mention that we are going to speak to two strands of literature, one on the theoretical side where there are notions of optimal policy. Uh, most importantly, the work of Sam uh, Korkman Weisbach, which we've been learning a lot from. Uh, compared to that work, we are going to go beyond two country settings, uh, which matters if we, uh, for, for the study of the climate club, where participation of multiple countries is something to explore. Then there is uh, the quantitative side of this, this literature, where, where there is no explicit notion of optimal policy, and we are going to uh, bring, uh, bring some notion of optimal policy uh, with respect to proposal one and two, so that we can address the full potential of these proposals. The work of Northhouse himself is also can, can lie into in this literature. Um, so very briefly on what uh, comes next. First, we want to develop a uh, model of trade that is multi-country and multi-industry. We extend it to have uh, CO2 externalities and a scale economies by firm entry, very much like the Krugman model. Then we derive fairly simple analytical formulas uh, for optimal taxes. Uh, this is uh, something like an envelope result that facilitates the task of characterizing optimal policy under general equilibrium uh, considerations. 
then we map the model together with these optimal tax formulas uh, to, to the data to evaluate the effectiveness of carbon border taxes, proposal one, and the climate club model, proposal two. So the theory is uh, fairly standard on the demand side. Uh, so this is a multi-sector recruitment model, monopolistic competitive markets. And for, uh, for having an abatement, a notion of abatement, we're going to have an extension of the classic work of Copeland and Taylor abatement model. Then we have many countries, each endowed by a given labor force. And we have many industries indexed typically by K here, each served by a massive symmetric firms and this mass is endogenous um, because of firm entry and on the demand side we have a three-tier consumption or utility function and the very upper tier there is demand between industry level composite goods it's like where you combine uh, chemicals and electronics and transportation bundles then within each of, each of these industries like chemicals there are varieties coming from different countries chemicals from china chemicals from mexico and elsewhere with the elasticity of substitution sigma. So this is the Armington model where trade in fact happens. And within each of these industry origin pairs like chemicals from China, there are products that are differentiated by their firms in a sense. There's the elasticity of substitution gamma that regulates markup. Um, then on the supply side, we have costly entry by potential firms in each country industry pair. Once you enter as a firm, then your production function is a CS aggregation between labor and carbon input with an elasticity of substitution, this var sigma parameter here. We adopt in the paper and here also an equivalent formulation to be closer to the literature on trade and environment, as I mentioned, the Copeland and Taylor specification of abatement by having this notion of a firm devoting a fraction A of its labor input to abatement and the rest to production. It's good in the sense that it highlights the trade-off that a firm faces between marginal cost and CO2 emission per unit of output or CO2 intensity. Basically, when there is a higher carbon tax, then a firm is going to adopt or undertake a higher level of abatement. By doing so, the firm incurs a higher marginal cost, but it can lower its CO2 emission per unit of output. That's the trade-off and how optimal abatement is going to be determined at the level of the firm, then we can aggregate firm level behavior in each country industry pair to have industry level aggregates. This is the price index, CO2 emission per industry in each country, as well as production, exports, imports, etc. Then the model generates the scale economies driven by costly entry of firms, and this operates through an abatement adjusted the scale of production. The model also nests constant returns to scale in the case that uh, entry is not costly. And this gamma parameter that governs the markup goes to infinity, so markups are zero. Um, so before showing you the optimal policy formulas uh, from a unilateral perspective, let me uh, give a bit of intuition about sources of inefficiencies from a unilateral standpoint. So if country I is my home country, from the perspective of this home country, the market equilibrium is going to be inefficient because of two reasons. First, that firms in any location do not internalize their CO2 externality on residents of the home country. Uh, so from a unilateral point of view, uh, we don't care about CO2 emission externality for residents of other countries, but for residents of the home country, then there are different degrees of scale economies across industries within a country that creates misallocations. So some rationale for industrial policy. Also there are export and import market power that remain unexploited with respect to the rest of the world. So the rationale for in terms of trade manipulation. And then let me also show you the instruments of policy that a government has access to, and then the objective function that a government is going to maximize. So the policy instruments are domestic carbon taxes, tau, then production subsidies, S, import tariffs, T, and export subsidies, X. With these taxes, we can show that the government can achieve the unilaterally first best. So if you introduce other taxes, they are going to be redundant. And production subsidies, import tariffs, and export subsidies, they are going to produce to create a wedge between producer price, which is the plain P and consumer price, which is P tilde, with the expression that I've written here, and carbon taxes are going to induce firm level abatement. Um, then the objective function of country I's government, uh, 
is going to be as follows. This WI is the objective function or the national welfare. It has two components. The first component is the indirect utility, uh, which is sort of a real consumption. Then the second part, in the linear way, the simplest way we could have is that is the, this utility from global CO2 emission. This phi parameter here is this utility per unit of CO2, and this summation term is world CO2 emission. Um, then the optimal unilateral policy of country I could be defined formally as a maximization of national welfare uh, given policies in other countries. So it's the maximization of this red I for this uh, objective function with respect to the, the vector of instruments in country I subject to the general equilibrium relationships. And this is exactly these general equilibrium feedback loops that makes this maximization problem or finding the characterizing optimal policy a difficult problem. And we do so by uh, extending and refining the dual approach that Ahmad has used in his other works. Um, here we produce an envelope result that helps the task of characterizing unilateral optimal policy. And we hope that these techniques could be used beyond this work. Uh, and with that, we can characterize uh, the four taxes I was mentioning before as follows. So the carbon tax tau is going to be uniform across industries. So the government doesn't care which industry a unit of CO2 is going to emit. And it depends on this phi parameter, which is this utility per unit of CO2. And production subsidy is not going to be used to target uh, climate issues. It's just marginal cost pricing that it targets. And it, in that sense, it's carbon blind. So it, uh, the targeting principle uh, precisely applies here. And uh, then we have, more importantly, maybe uh, formulas for uh, carbon, for border taxes that include carbon related uh, motives. So starting with import tariffs, um, we have the, this one plus omega, omega is inver inverse of export supply elasticity. So if I didn't have the term in bracket, that was sort of the classic in the literature uh, with general equilibrium considerations, which is more recent in the literature, but the term in bracket is what we call carbon border tax. And it has three elements and it shows up in an additive way with respect to the other terms. The first term is phi, how much you care about uh, climate damage. Uh, and then the second part is that when you are exporting uh, from in industrial good K from country J, maybe chemicals from China, what is CO CO2 emission per dollar of output? What is carbon intensity of what you are importing? Then you wanna have this correction because of the scale effects. And if gamma is uh, infinity, in fact, that terms is one then um, we get a sort of similar logic on the export subsidy side, which I'm showing here. There's this first term that is again, like if we didn't have um, the climate objectives in the model, I only uh, would have this first term, but this second term also shows up here for the sake of time. Let me just say that the intuition behind it is, is that you wanna promote exports of your country to the rest of the world, particularly when you're competing with carbon intensive foreign varieties. Um, and so with that, let me just explain what we mean by uh, the, the proposal one, by proposal one in that, we are going to have a notion of non-cooperative Nash equilibrium. So these policy formulas that I showed you in general equilibrium is going to be implemented in a one-shot game in which governments non-cooperatively or unilateral are going to simultaneously choose their unilateral optimal policy, taking policies of other countries as given. We're going to solve this Nash game in a one-shot setup. And um, I'm going to report results for that, but we are going to benchmark that with respect to what is globally optimal. And the problem of the global optimal policy is just the maximization of the sum of welfare across all countries, again, subject to all general equilibrium relationships. Uh, this is a simpler problem that, than unilateral optimal policy. And the, the outcome of it is going to be as follows, that carbon taxes per country is not going to be your phi only, but the sum of those phi's, you can think about the, the sum of those phi's as a social cost of carbon. Production subsidy is going to be, again, marginal cost pricing. And from a global standpoint, import tariffs or export subsidies are going to be inefficient, so they are just zero. So here, global optimal carbon tax is going to correct CO2 externality 
that a producer generates for consumers, not just for the residents of a particular country, but for consumers all over the world. And it's going to be uniform, no matter which country or industry that is going to be emitted. Um, Five minutes, Farid. Okay, great. So let me go to the quantitative policy analysis. We use HAT algebra based on sufficient and statistic approach. And for today's talk, I'm going to set the social cost of carbon at 31. We've done uh, more alternative values of that. We have structural elasticity of trade elasticity, the markup elasticity, and carbon demand elasticity, which we estimate using the standard techniques in the literature. So proposal one is that one-shot Nash game where governments are going to incorporate carbon border taxes. Um, and so this is sort of a summary of the results. Uh, for non-cooperative, uh, when I'm referencing it against the global cooperative outcome. Uh, I'm, I'm showing just a select set of countries here, but let me just uh, read to you what we find for the reduction in CO2 emissions in the case of non-cooperative relative to the global cooperate, globally cooperative case. So in the case of non-cooperative uh, outcome, we find that um, the reduction in CO2 emissions is just 0.6%. In the case of global cooperation, that is 61%. Is another way to say that non-cooperative taxes replicate only 1% of what, it, what could be achieved uh, by, by cooperation in a nationally. Uh, this is robust to a wide range of specifications. For the sake of time, let's just mention that this 0.6% can be as high as two or three percent, um, depending on the exact specification that you use, but it remains to be low and we wanted to understand why it is low. Um, so, and we can discuss maybe later more about this, but there are two main reasons that are responsible here. One is that a large share of CO2 emissions are generated in low tradable industries, so they do not cross borders, so carbon border taxes cannot be target them directly. The other reason is that carbon border taxes, at least in our interpretation, they are like tariffs. So they are defined at the level of industry and firms take industry level variables as given. So a firm is not going to internalize its impact of uh, abatement on the aggregate industry level uh, carbon intensity that is targeted by these carbon border taxes. So it's another, way to say that these carbon border taxes are not granular enough to induce firm level abatement. Uh, with this, let me move to proposal two, which is the climate club model. We are uh, largely inspired by writings of North House here. Uh, here is the, you can think about this game in a sense as a two stage game. In the first stage, uh, each country is going to choose whether to be uh, in the club or not. And in the second stage, countries are going to uh, depending on the structure, who is in the club, who is not, they are going to set the trade taxes and emission taxes. Also, for this climate club to be meaningfully defined, we need at least one country to be a core member, meaning that that country is going to commit to the rules of membership and does not play strategically. Uh, we are going to uh, assume that EU is the core member and possibly other countries also can be a core member too. And so here is just once you are in the club. So if you choose to be a member, then you're going to impose no tariff against other members, but you're going to uh, use your trade penalties, what is unilaterally optimal against non-members. If you are a non-member, we allow you to uh, retaliate against members but by what is unilaterally optimal. But uh, in terms of trade taxes with respect to non-members, you are going to stay at a status quo. If your ta tariff is three or 5%, you can just stay there. On the emission tax side, if you are a member, then you, you have to increase your individual phi to the sum of phi, so from unilateral optimal to global optimal. But if you are a non-member, you stay at your status quo. For us, that is status quo is what is unilaterally optimal, which is a very low carbon tax for most countries here. So the main trade-off is that by joining the club, a country is going to incur a production loss because of adopting a higher carbon tax, but at the same time, it can escape from members trade penalty. Uh, what we find first is that the club of all nations is a Nash equilibrium and doesn't, no matter who core members are. Uh, 
And so here in this graph, I'm showing for each country in the sample, welfare gains of staying in the club versus unilaterally withdrawing, which is going to be positive for all countries, less so maybe for Brazil and China, which are big countries with low care for climate and larger for countries that are smaller, but have a higher care for climate like Canada, but it's positive for everybody. So that means that club of all nations is a Nash equilibrium. However, the challenge is that there can be other Nash equilibria here. And so characterizing all of those uh, is not easy. And the reason is because there's a huge number of combination of countries that can potentially form an equilibrium club. This is curse of dimensionality we are facing here. We exploit a key property of this game, which is net benefit of joining the club is going to rise in the club size because the club size collective trade penalty is going to be stronger when the club is larger. Uh, and so we, we have this technique to shrink the outcome space. And what we find is that whether or not the club of all nations is the unique Nash equilibrium depends uh, crucially on the makeup of the core members with the EU as the only core member. In fact, we find another Nash equilibrium, which is just EU as, as the club and everybody else outside of the club. But once the US also joins to be a core member, the club of all nations becomes the unique Nash equilibrium. And what we find there is that CO2 emission reduction because of EU and US is going to be 8.3%, but because of other members, that's going to be more than 72%, 52%, and together they are going to be 61%, which is what is globally optimal. Uh, before I finish, just one other thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, here, what, what other, one, one other parameter that matters is the global carbon tax or what is the carbon tax target? Uh, if it is too high, then the club of all nations is not going to be uh, the Nash equilibrium. So it's, it's, uh, it, it has to be sufficiently small. Um, uh, and we have more results in the paper, if, or we can maybe uh, discuss after this. So uh, as a summary, what we find is the carbon border taxes can reduce CO2 emissions only to a limited degree. However, the climate club, can be remarkably effective at reducing CO2 emissions. And that depends on two things, the makeup of its core members, also the carbon tax target not to be too large. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope that I'm um, on time. Otherwise, I apologize. I, uh, thanks, Farid. I, I'm going to ask a question, but others should raise their hand if they, I don't want to monopolize. But uh, two things. One was kind of clarifying. I think when you say that when you're in the club, you put in the unilaterally optimal, it, you might want to mention that then the unilaterally optimal is a function of how many other others are in the club. It's unilaterally optimal from the point of view of the club, right? Exactly. In, in that general equilibrium, depending on who is who are in the club and who yeah, are Yeah, so as more join the club, that unilaterally optimal becomes probably more aggressive or more trying to achieve more, I, I assume. That's, that's right. And then yes. my other question is, suppose you, you've shown that the club of all nations is an Ash equilibrium. I mean, I know that I'm kind of joking, but why can't you just say, oh, well, now we're done. We just all get in a room together and say, look, you know, there's an Ash equilibrium. If we all do this, let's just all do it. And there's no reason for anybody to oppose that. Why does it really matter if there's any other Nash equilibrium? Because it's not going to be, it's going to be done through some, you know, sort of like a Paris Accord where everybody gets together. So somehow it doesn't seem like it necessarily matters if there's other Nash equilibria. I, I guess I'm just putting that I wasn't, I just, you might, you probably thought a lot about that. So I want that. Yeah, I think one question or one objection to that is that, okay, so why we are not, why is it the case that we are not seeing that? And one answer which we were trying to provide is that because there are other Nash equilibria. Hmm. I see, I see you're using... So would there be a way to rank the Nash equilibria in terms of maybe there's some Nash equilibria that's better for India, so they would rather not do the club of all nations because they like this other Nash equilibria where they'll do better? I mean, is there something going on like that? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, and we've been thinking about like, because the globally 
the club of all nations matches precisely the globally optimal outcome right on right. trade and climate right but we know that that is beneficial for every participant given transfers right and so i think we we can we can recover those transfers that can guarantee that everybody is better off or if there is a ranking between those equilibria, this is the best still for every participant. Right, right. Good, thanks. I, uh, uh, yes, see, Maxim. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks for it. Um, interesting presentation. So, um, I was wondering about the impacts of of your C bomb and and carbon pricing policy. So, if I correctly understood, you have a thirty. Bond, so the door carbon price, and that reduces emissions by sixty percent globally. Is this correct? Uh, or did yes. I misinterpret this? Yes, something? in our in our main specification, yes. And mm. I was just hinting that we've done other specifications depending on exact parameter values. You get different outcomes, but the main message um, that I was trying to say, mm. summarized here, would remain the same. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I was just wondering whether you try to derive kind of marginal abatement cost curves from your model and compare those with with uh, marks generated by other models like energy system models or you know more advanced AMs to see whether they are comparable. Uh, because like sixty percent reduction, uh, like at the top of my head, from like most energy system model would come I don't know maybe a two hundred dollar carbon price something like that range. So I was a little bit surprised, but yeah, maybe that's, that's just the model feature. Uh, so it's it's more like a comment on validation versus other available frameworks. Yeah. No, that, that's a great comment. It's just that there is, and I, I think I didn't show, but there is this parameter. Um, and in fact, we had we had a Cobb Douglas for this production function uh, first. Um, and then we made it like CES because we received a similar comment as yours. Uh, if this elasticity of substitution between carbon and labor is lower, then I think the number that our paper would generate would be more similar to the papers you were mentioning. But we estimated it and we got like 0.6. If it is like 0.2, uh, I think we'll get a comparable result. And we tried to do some robustness on that. Um, but, but your suggestion about like marginal uh, abatement schedule is great so uh, we should work more on that thank you thank you good ishan uh i guess i i sort of had a thought on sam's question or kind of a follow-up i was i was thinking maybe one reason the intermediate nash equilibria are important i'm curious if you agree is because at some point there needs to be like credibility established that the countries in the club will follow through on punishing the other countries. So it might be like, if you believe fully that the clubs will do what they're saying they'll do, then it's optimal for every country and everyone joins. But it might be the case that some countries like don't really necessarily believe uh, that the climate club will follow through on these policies that punish the countries outside the club, which also incur some costs inside the club. So maybe you need some like initial set of nations to join and actually do the thing. And then the other countries will be like, oh, they're actually punishing us. We have to join too. Is that like a reasonable way to think about it? Or do you think I'm missing something? No, you're. I think you're exactly spot on. And that's the idea, I think, behind the climate club, that there are going to be at least one core member or subset of countries that act as core members so they do not play strategically. They commit to the rules of membership, meaning that they increase their um, carbon taxes to what is maybe globally optimal to or to some uh, to target carbon targeted carbon tax whatever it is and then they also use their trade penalties to in order to incentivize others so it just starts all from there because if you don't have any core member you go back to non-cooperative outcome got it that makes and sense. that seems like the credible signal or action that you were referring to that resembles that I guess that my one related thought is there, I'm curious how this relates. There's like this other paper by Steve Sakala and David Hamous or something that's like unraveling climate change. I think it's like a similar mechanism in terms of the buildup from a few countries uh, to, to many countries. And so I don't know that paper well enough to have anything insightful to say. I just like, 
thought that it'd be, I'd be curious to know how their mechanism relates to this idea too at some point. Yeah, some of these issues I think could be best understood if we had a dynamic model like Gary's paper, but you know, having optimal policy in a dynamic setting generally could be just hard one step at a time, but maybe that's, I, others know better in this room, but maybe that's one way to explore these considerations more. That makes sense. Ishan, thanks. Can you put that reference in the chat? And uh, Erwin, did you have a question? Yes, just a quick one. Um, so um, Farid, thanks for the presentation. Um, is it possible for you to instead use a particular climate target, for example, let's say a temperature change, um, instead of imposing a carbon tax? So you have a temperature change target, for example, that is exogenous, and that will endogenize the carbon tax. And then that will further affect how the, um, the emission changes across countries um, will, will, be, will play out. So um, I wonder if, if that's possible. That way you don't focus so much on, on a particular carbon tax, um, but instead on, on the climate target. Um, and then the other um, um, suggestion that I might have is, are you able to include um, in here the nationally determined contributions um, that are um, more relevant in the, in the intermediate term? Right. Um, so, yeah, but, but thank you. No, thanks. Uh, great comments. The first one, we, we don't have um, a temperature module in our model to, to, to have that currently. That, that's a great suggestion. Let me think more about it. For, for that, I'm pretty sure that we need like one of these modules that maps temperature and it, it has a feedback from that. Um, so we need to build that into, into a model like this and we don't have it currently. That's why we went with like carbon tax target. And, and your second point, I wasn't sure what, what you meant exactly. Can you elaborate a bit more if we have time? So in, in the Paris Agreement, there's um, each country committed to, to a certain um, reduction target um, over the next 10 years, for example. Um, so I wonder um, if, if you have those information, um, if it's possible for you to include that in your Nash equilibrium. Um, of course, we don't know. We, we, it's, uh, it will be further complicated because those are commitments, right? Um, not all, all of them are um, committed to achieving the target and not all of them are, are working towards that target. So it, yeah, it's I see. just a, but a maybe broad idea. Instead of globally optimal, it could be something which is sub-globally optimal, but higher than unilaterally optimal. And that could map to what you suggested, right? Yeah, and yeah, and then finally, well, just um, a quick one: um, carbon leakage uh, maybe would be a good one to to include um, in your analysis. Um, without the the carbon, without the Nash equilibrium, how much leakage would there be um, globally? Um, but thank you. Sure, we we do have that certainly here. I just didn't have time, so I didn't report it. But but sure, yeah, thanks. These are great comments. Thank you. Okay, great. So now I think we sh we get some overall discussion from Maxime uh, Chevalier. Uh, yeah, thank you. So what I was planning to do is to uh, briefly discuss some data challenges that I think, yeah, um, kind of all all communities of both CGE and and um, and TGMs face in terms of looking forward, projecting macro changes, uh, population demographic changes. And then I'll briefly comment on differences between the two approaches. And, and then we can have a discussion on kind of how we can benefit from, from model comparisons and model linkages, what gaps we see uh, in, in both approaches and how we can bridge them and, and there, Oh, any comments and, and uh, no participations from presenters would be uh, highly appreciated. Uh, so in terms of uh, first data challenges and recent and, and some recent developments, I, I would like to focus on two points. So first, a global uh, multi-region input-output models uh, that um, many, in, well, especially in the CG community, of course, we, we, we rely on those to uh, calibrate our models, but also in, in, in TTM communities. Uh, 
I know a lot of people use uh, world input output database and then, uh, for instance, Xiaobase or Eora uh, to, um, to parameterize their intersectoral linkages. And, and I think one uh, kind of uh, step forward would be to, to close a look into intercomparison between these um, different MRIOs. So um, I also wanted to uh, to bring to your attention the fact that a recently a new global MRIO has been released called, called Emerging. So, uh, and uh, it covers 135 sectors and uh, 245 economies. Uh, and, and also there, they try to focus on a lot on developing countries and, and small economies and, and provide as, 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 as good as possible representations of, of uh, uh, this particular low income and, and small economies. So potentially something to uh, kind of try to use uh, within um, our communities. Um, of course, each of these MROs has their strengths and, and weaknesses, but multi MRIO comparison so would definitely be beneficial and not so um I, I there are some papers that use let's say both viet and and uh, or exile based to parameterize models so it would be great to see more of this work and and in particular in the in the center in the GTAP center we are working on providing GTAP and Mario in a flat format so wide style format like uh in and um square uh, uh, metrics so hopefully this would also allow to uh, kind of better benefit from um from from this mrio in their um, community work so a uh, second point i i also wanted to uh, discuss is the future mark projections um as a lot of us we rely on shared socioeconomic pathways uh, framework in in looking forward and uh, projecting demographic and and macro changes and this framework is uh, of course well grounded it's uh, used a lot in the climate community but since it has been a while as these scenarios have been constructed so the reference here is is uh 2010 and it hasn't been updated since then um, the world has changed substantially since then so here you can see a couple of charts on how gdp growth rates compare across several um so on the left you see G g7 countries so there due to covid and um a lot of other impacts uh, changes are substantial across selected years but then they kind of converge when we uh, uh when we average across years but in other cases especially developing countries in in like sub-saharan africa uh aggregate on on, on uh, the chart on the right we can see that there are some substantial deviations between uh ssp projections and uh and more recent imf economic uh, outlook so um, kind of updating SSPs is something that uh, currently the IPCC community and climate community is looking into. We also are uh, um, conducting uh, in, in the center work on, on kind of bridging the shorter term projections with this longer term SSPs. And I just wanted to briefly uh, provide an overview of how scenario modeling community is currently um, um, uh, carrying out work on updating shared socioeconomic pathways and these updated scenarios would be released within the next year or so. So hopefully uh, we would be able to use it in, in our models. Um, and and this, there is a plan of updating this uh, shared socioeconomic pathways on multiple dimensions. Uh, within the next few years starting from just the base year update uh merging historical and short-term forecasts with kind of long-term trajectories and then updating projections using better uh history and updated you know uh, methodological framework um including also downscaling of ssps and and here i, I uh, would like to mention the several recent papers that provides um, an estimate of a gridded level GDP forecast. So this is a recent nature paper by Wan and Sun, and also gridded population forecasts, um, also um, a paper released uh, early this year by um, Olin and Lefstein 
So both try to kind of extend and, and downscale their uh, shared socioeconomic pathways forecasts, and, and this would be particularly important uh, for their uh, work presented on spatial distribution of effects of, of climate change. Um, so there are also some alternative frameworks being developed uh, in terms of projecting future macro and population drivers. So one particular work in this regard is carrying out in the resources for the future group uh, by Renard and, and colleagues. So they develop probabilistic projections of GDP, population, um, um, climate change. Uh, so which gives a little bit different uh, flavor to their future developments of the economy, but it allows to uh, take into account the potential uncertainty of their uh, kind of future um, economic development. So that's that's an alternative framework that can be also used for uh, the long-term um, kind of forecasts and projections. Uh, and now a few thoughts on, on potential kind of differences between um, NQTMs and, and uh, TG communities and, uh, and some thoughts on how uh, we can benefit from, from differences in, in each of these frameworks. Uh, so of course, as, as we have seen uh, from, from presentations today, uh, two, two modeling frameworks just, uh, I, uh, serve somewhat different purposes. So um, the in, in, in the TG in classical TG world, we are trying to uh, to have this more rigorous data structure uh, with with more advanced um, sector linkages, uh, better data parameterizations. But then the models are uh, calibrated rather than estimated. Uh, while in in the quantitative uh, 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 theory. Uh, we, we see that uh, you know, we, we strive for more models validation and, and um, structural estimation, which gives them uh, better empirical insights, but, but then on the downside, we have uh, lower kind of um, uh, model details. So um, some of the differences between two frameworks um, include, for instance, the, the richness that we have in TG include this representation of um, import demand shared by agents. Uh, so different sourcing of imports across final consumers, intermediate users, representations of savings, investment, capital flows. Uh, also have tax instruments, import taxes, export subsidies, uh, additional sectoral richness, like different generation technologies, which hopefully provides kind of a better representation of, for instance, abatement costs. And that's getting uh, back to Farid's presentation. Uh, but on the other hand, this empirical validation is something I think that has been missing in the uh, TG literature. There has been some work done by Peter Dixon and colleagues on backcasting uh, using um, TG models, focusing on selected countries like uh, US, Brazil, but, but because of the size of, of the model, it's proven to be very time consuming, labor intensive exercise to, to validate model, even for, for, for one country, yeah? uh, going back, let's say 10 or 20 years. Uh, so one particular um, point of, of concern or rather uh, you know, uh, feature is that uh, we, we often use different uh, functional force for representing, let's say, consumer behavior. Although we have seen uh, today a talk where non-homothetic -non uh, CS has been implied, uh, applied in their um, quantitative type models as well. Uh, but one particular kind of issue and, and feature we are often struggling in the TG uh, world when looking into the long run is, um, is consumer's behavior. So uh, we, we are trying to capture the features that uh, let's say households spend a specific portion of their budget on food and that this share essentially decreases over time as, as households get richer. And it often proves to be uh, somewhat complicated to capture, especially when we go into like really long run by 2050 or 2100. And so that the share of expenditure on basic goods kind of decreases over time. And 
And when we link these value flows with quantity flows, when we incorporate, let's say, energy uh, flows or nutritional flows into the modeling framework, uh, we often observe that there is this like expensive behavior on, on calorie consumption by households. Um, so this uh, need, uh, provides a need of, to, to, to implement the more flexible uh, functional forms and, and uh, implement adjustments over time. So um, that's something we uh, kind of try to take into account in, in, uh, in the long run. And one question is how does this issue, whether it arises in, uh, in, in case of an um, NTTM's model and especially if CS functions are, are used. Uh, so to kind of conclude and, and pave the way forward, one particular uh, thought I, I had in terms of bridging the gaps between two frameworks is trying to, um, to look into the possibilities of having a multi-model comparison exercises. So when, when um, let's say several TGE and several NQTMs model would focus on one particular question like climate mitigation or carbon border adjustment or climate impacts, and then um, trying to, uh, to, to estimate the results and, and compare, uh, kind of implement the cross validations across different framework and see whether uh, we can um, derive any structurally um, kind of comparable results or whether we have differences and then try to uh, decompose these differences and see whether we can then improve the parameterization of, of each of, uh, of the models. Uh, so uh, yeah, and and I'll stop here. And um, it would be yeah, very interesting to see what um, what others think about potential kind of gaps between the two uh, modeling approaches and how we can close them or, or benefit from um, model exchanges or comparisons. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Maxim. If people um, uh, raise their hands, we can. Let me just ask a little bit. Uh, I think I, I actually kind of misread the beginning. What does the N in NQTM stand for? I think new. New, okay. Yeah. So, they, I mean, I guess some to some extent, I feel like that class of models would be sort of more experimental. And so that's kind of good to have sort of some more experimental, you know, trying out new things easily because they're small and kind of flexible, experimental, so that you can kind of include new features more easily. And then there should be other models that are more, which I think I'm gonna say are more like the, CGE models that then kind of embody the the winning experiments or the successful experiments. So I feel like that's useful, but uh, so I'm not sure there's any problem, but I do feel like the comparison of how, you know, how, how they give differing predictions about a particular thing we're interested in, interested in is very healthy, so. Uh, anyway, now we're starting to get questions, except I've lost track of, oh, maybe I don't see, didn't I see some hands uh, raised on that? Yeah, Erwin? Yeah, um, thanks, Sam. Um, so just to um, raise two points that, um, or just to address two points that, that Maxim raised, um, on the um, data, for example, uh, Maxim mentioned that, um, in in the structural estimation um mostly um the data being used is is from wired so starting I, if i'm not mistaken towards the end of last year um we started coordinating with lorenzo um caliendo um and we started providing him the 2014 reference year data of of gtap um gtap mrio format in in the flat um, wired format. And then um, I think about a few months ago, uh, March or April, 
um, we've also provided the 2014, uh, the two, the 2011 data, um, and then we agreed that um, in the next few months we will also produce the 2007 and 2004 data, um, and then share it with with Lorenzo. So um, I think Farid also has access to that 2014 data, um, but for the other ones, we're we're going to rerun the the, the MRIO. Um, construction um, to to create um, those um, other three reference years, um, because when we started building the GTAP MRIO data, it takes so much time that we said we'll just do one reference year. Um, but now, since there's more demand um, for it, um, we're starting to build uh, multi-reference years. And then when we go to version eleven of the database with an additional um, twenty seventeen reference year, we're, we'll also produce that. Um, 2017 reference year, um, and then um, I don't um, just I, sorry for for a self plug. Um, Maxim was uh, mentioned something about comparison of of CGE and um, um, NT, NQTM models. So um, we've been working with um, with Eddie Beckers at WTO on creating a, a, a GTAP model that that we call GTAP um, EK which is an Eton Cortum version of the GTAP model. Um, so we've been um, working on that and then um, comparing results um, between the standard GTAP model and the GTAP EK model. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll do a final push um, this summer. Um, and yeah, we would appreciate if, if um, we'll, we'll try to send you a version of the paper and then we'll, we'll appreciate if you um, could give us comments on that. Yeah, thank you, uh, Tom. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm, I'm really glad um, uh, to see this session. Um, thanks to Anton for organizing, thanks to Sam for chairing and everyone for presenting. Um, uh, this is, yeah, this is, uh, these are two communities that need to interact more. I know the GTAP community would benefit tremendously from more of these kinds of sessions, these interactions. Um, I found um, just even within the CGE community, um, <clears throat> focusing on our common resource, which is the really heavy one, the data itself, um, models are cheap in the end. Um, it's the data that's, that's challenging. And so if we can um, start using common data sets, um, and doesn't have to be GTAP, we're certainly investing a lot of resources in that direction to make it more useful. Um, I think that that would be a great uh, starting point. I think um, uh, what I'd be really interested in is um, comparing parameters, um, the, the, the parameters that, say, Farid was just talking about abatement costs, you know, uh, or the labor, you know, emissions substitution. Um, and Maxime had one view kind of bottom up. Um, Farid observed something else in the data. Um, that's the kind of thing that would be extremely useful, I think, for the GTAP community and maybe also useful for people like Farid, a bit of a reality check or a further validation of what he's done. I think that's an area where there'd be huge benefits. Um, of course, to compare parameters, we need to have common kind of model structures. <laughs> and uh, so the work Erwin and others are doing to, to proliferate the types of, of, of model CGE CG community is using that that's important incorporate all of those innovations that Sam was alluding to that you know filter their way to the top but but I think that the common data set is it's so much work goes into the data and the data are so important in the end for um, for the estimation and other purposes and we have a tremendous resource in the GTAP consortium in that community. I mean, you think about how the tariff data, for example, has evolved since the first data set where um, Brad McDonald was copying numbers out of the WTO country reports to now where we're, we've got the International Trade Center in Geneva that's actually collecting these data out there. They are developing it and formatting it in a very particular way, processing it in a very particular way to be incorporated into GTAP. And that's the kind of thing that um, has evolved over 30 years, and we need to leverage that. I think it will improve your estimation. And um, so that, um, as Maxime and Erwin were alluding to, um, 
know, the approach now is to um, rebuild the time series every time. So because the methods change, uh, the, you know, the GDP numbers for Nigeria in 2014 maybe have gone up by 30% in the last revision uh, because they realized they missed something. Um, rebuilding that time series in a, in, with the same methods, uh, consistent methods and the, the best possible data, that's something the GTAP community is committed to and I think will greatly improve the quality of uh, uh, things going forward and you folks doing the estimation will realize you need more information you need this or that can we get it can we get the consortium members to provide that um you know sam i think a great goal for next year's board meeting might be to have someone like yourself um give a short presentation to the board of a wish list and um, mm -hmm. um what you see as the big limitations currently um um this could really help um advance both our communities but i know the the, the gtap community would benefit tremendously from um the empirically based work that's being done now excellent work and um uh, this session was exemplified that so i'll stop there yeah thanks tom i uh, i i'm uh, definitely agree with uh, i i feel like the investment in data and and having a kind of common you know this is the best we have right now or most detailed is great there's a little bit of uh you know i don't there's also some experimentation in data these days because people are getting data from all sorts of new places and that's good too and again you know once in a while some of that can kind of be brought into the main body of data that we trust or think is reasonable but yeah i i would definitely be happy to take part in in something like you're talking about were there are there other uh uh thoughts people want to throw out there let me um just say i i really enjoyed the papers I, as i mentioned i've heard all three before but uh it was great to hear them again. And even with 20 minutes, I think that was kind of good because then we had plenty of time for questions as well. But uh, thanks very much for, for uh, taking part. It was a nice, nice session.